both the Carter and the Reagan administrations really were uh, dominated by crises. In fact, both of them were dominated uh, by, by Iran. Now, as far as um, Carter was concerned, uh, the Iran uh, hostage crisis really uh, you know, was the dominant foreign policy uh, disaster uh, during his administration. Uh, and many Democrats you know, largely blame uh, that uh, fact that you know, cost him a second term. Um, looking at you know, relations with Iran by the late uh, 70s, um, the, the rule of the Iranian monarch, the Shah, had become more and more authoritarian. Really, over we're looking at you know several decades of authoritarian rule. We had massive demonstrations uh, in Iran uh, at the time, which many in the State Department and the CIA really uh, regarded uh, as demonstrations. Nobody really had a proper uh, appreciation that what was happening was a revolutionary movement. Um, we had the first time that the embassy, in fact, the U.S. embassy was uh, taken by students and, and protesters. It was seventy eight, and the Iranian police came in uh, and. Uh, the you know uh, authority of the U.S. Uh, staff was uh, uh, restored, um, <clears throat> and uh, the actual crisis started in '79 when you know protesters, students, uh, you know stormed the U.S. embassy uh, and uh, took uh, embassy staff hostages, both diplomats, uh, Marines, uh, and and other staff, which was seconded uh, to the embassy. Um, this uh, was triggered by the fact that the Shah was allowed to undergo treatment for cancer in the hospital in New York City. Uh, so Carter was confronted with that a choice that, so again, the, the Shah had fled uh, Iran uh, after the revolution was successful, first to Egypt and the Panama, uh, and he was in you know, late stage uh, cancer. Uh, and asked for permission to uh, have treatment uh, in the United States. And, and Carter really was in the dilemma that he knew what the impact could possibly be uh, in uh, back in Iran. Uh, but he was also uh, conscious of the fact that this was a U.S. ally for decades. What message would it send uh, to other countries? Uh, subsequently, the Iranian uh, you know, protesters uh, group took those, hosti those diplomats hostage asked for the release of the monarch um, and that led to of course uh, protests in, in the United States too. One is Iranian expats protesting outside the New York City hospital but then also Americans uh, who were uh, increasingly uneasy about what was happening with uh, in Iran uh, and became a lot more critical of the Carter administration. Now again, when this happened, there really was no equivalent of uh, you know a sort of a standard operating procedure to fall back on because you know this was U.S. embassies are sacrosanct, they are protected under diplomatic law. Uh, these sort of things don't happen. Um, you know, Carter immediately froze uh, assets uh, and uh, was subject to different forms of advice. So again, his uh, Secretary of State Cyrus Vance he advocated for more diplomatic. Uh, a solution uh, we had. He cited the U.S. as uh, Pueblo affair, which was a, a, a U.S. submarine um, captured by the North Koreans, and that actually was, you know, those sailors uh, were in, in the end uh, freed. Uh, it was, you know, he said, care, caution, a solution without spilling blood, just like we had in North Korea in 1968. Uh, Yasser Arafat, the head of the PLO, in fact, he uh, provided his good uh, offices. And women and African Americans were released uh, from the hostages. Uh, the Iranian cited that because women and African Americans were already facing uh, oppression in the United States, it would not be wise for them to uh, continue to keep them as hostages. Break of relations happened formally in uh, April 1980. Uh, the CIA said that pulling a Mossadegh was beyond reach. Pulling a Mossadegh meaning another covert action, just like they had in 1953, which uh, uh, you know, ended uh, the uh, the premiership of Mossadegh uh, and installed uh, the Shah uh, as the sole ruler. So this sort of you know covert coup d'état uh, was not possible because what we really had was a, a revolution in Iran. It was the end of the monarchy, so that was appreciated. Um, you know, Carter eventually ordered a rescue operation, which, uh, contrary to Cyrus Vance, uh, he did not like. He said, you know, we already had our allies. 
Uh, they're supporting us with sanctions. Uh, the March list, which is the Iranian parliament, is about, uh, uh, to me, there's no immediate danger. Uh, the Iranians might retaliate and the whole Middle East might be inflamed. Um, with his knife in his back, Carter said uh, he uh, vowed to stick with it uh, and ordered the uh, rescue uh, operation. Um, what happened, uh, Cyrus Vance, the Secretary of State, uh, he uh, resigned over that. Uh, largely, the uh, rescue operation was advocated by Brzezinski, who was the National Security Advisor and who was a lot more hawkish uh, uh, in, in these sort of foreign policy matters than, than the Secretary of State. Uh, the uh, Operation Eagle Claw was the first operation by Delta, uh, Delta Force. Uh, the idea was the U.S. Uh, would have several forward operating bases in the Iranian desert, in fact two, uh, starting from an aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf. And from there, from the second forward operating base, they would go into Tehran, uh, would take out the power of that part of Tehran where the embassy was, take out the hostages and go back. What happened, a sandstorm happened, um, aircrafts collided, uh, um, and uh, several U.S. Uh, uh, servicemen, in fact, uh, were killed as a result, and the mission had to be um, uh, terminated. There was one officer who said, thank God for the sandstorm, because had it not been for the sandstorm, it would have been uh, even worse if he actually had managed to get into Tehran. Uh, it would have been uh, quite a, a horrible, a horrible um, mission. Um, as I said, the hostage crisis itself, uh, you know, the Shah eventually died in 1980, it became a lot more political back home uh, too, uh, uh, as well, not only a foreign policy crisis. So again, looking at Iranians living in the United States, those who were monarchists and then those who were for the revolution and then Americans uh, who, you know, saw Iranians uh, as a security threat. It was the start of the Iran-Iraq war and Reagan uh, had been elected. Uh, largely, uh, the Iranians waited with the release of the hostages um, after Reagan was elected, so forcing Carter to end his term with a foreign policy disaster and allowing Reagan to start his uh, term with a foreign policy victory or success. Uh, the um, release of the hostages was done through the Algier Accords. These were negotiations between Iranians and Americans during the Carter administration in uh, Algiers in Algeria, uh, which uh, basically the United States pledged not to ever... Uh, um, advocate for regime change uh, in Iran in exchange, release some uh, assets uh, which have been frozen in exchange for the release of the hostages. Um, the outcome, the balance sheet, you know, it was 444 days. Uh, 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 that was the time uh, where these hostages were being held uh, by the Iranians. An important ally was gone, an uh, important uh, resource uh, for supplier for oil, of course. It was wounded pride, you know, after, you know, the post-Vietnam uh, period. And then the lessons, you know, we have to separate from right-wing regimes. Uh, aid and weapons are really unable uh, to survive, uh, uh, secure the survival of these uh, authoritarian uh, regimes. Uh, it was after that the U.S. attempted to substitute. We had a buildup of Saudi Arabia, as a surrogate, Pakistan, uh, Turkey, and also Iraq. Of course, Turkey uh, was uh, already a NATO uh, member. Member. So again, these were the Carter's choices. So again, looking at foreign policy analysis, what was he um, offered, or what 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 sort of options did he have? First one was Cyrus Vaughan said, "Well, wait until the political solution is stabilized. That will protect the hostages from further harm." Uh, but waiting also always looks like doing nothing to the public. So you know, Char Carter will be charged with ineffectiveness. Breaking relations and imposing an embargo that was executed uh, in, between November and April um, had a very low variance in outcome value. Which it's not the optimal outcome, but not the worst either. So it was balancing between you protecting U.S. interests while catering also uh, to allies. The ros rescue operation was seen as the best balance of political and military risk. If it had been successful, it would have been great. It would have you know, been meant to return to the status ante. It would have demonstrated military prowess to the world. Uh, it, it really would have been um, the best possible uh, outcome had it been successful. And of course, it wasn't. Mine Iranian harbors and interrupt commerce. That was another option that would have been 
amounted to an act of war and that most likely would have inflamed the entire region into a war and an all-out military attack which had high political and military risk um, and certainly wouldn't have guaranteed the release of the hostages. Uh, so really a combination of one and two was done, uh, break relations, embargo and then as I mentioned earlier the Algier Accords were these negotiations between Iranians and uh, American uh, diplomats which led uh, to uh, the release of the hostages. Now the second uh, important element of Carter's foreign policy was the Carter Doctrine. The Carter Doctrine was uh, a really an immediate um, proclamation of what is at stake after the Soviet Union uh, invaded Afghanistan. Here in the photo you see uh, Brzezinski uh, uh, the National Security Advisor uh, talking to a member of the Pakistani uh, Armed Forces uh, who became you know the main conduit uh, in uh, funneling uh, US um, military uh, support to the Mujahideen through Pakistan. Um, the Carter Doctrine uh, meant uh, uh, stated that any uh, attack on the Persian Gulf on the Middle East at large but particular Persian Gulf uh, would be seen as an attack on the U.S. itself. Uh, so uh, the the main price uh, was the Middle East. It was not Afghanistan, but it was seen that Afghanistan could be used as a gateway to the Middle East towards attacking U.S. Uh, energy uh, uh, interest. Um, the speech itself, the State Department didn't really read the speech. It was, you know, it really he played all of his cards uh, from uh, the uh, outset. Um, boycotting the uh, you know the Olympic Games uh, you know uh, sanctions against the Soviet Union, so that it was very little uh, left for you know escalating a you know a sort of a graduated response uh, against uh, the Soviets. Um, this was uh, you know Carter's uh, Carter's uh, foreign policy. So we're looking at Iran, and we're looking at uh, you know the Carter Doctrine after the invasion of uh, Afghanistan. Now, moving on to, to Reagan, we see this sort of uh, revivalism under Reagan. You know, there was a revivalism of the Cold War after Nixon's uh, detente. Um, a lot, uh, um, really, of US foreign policy under Reagan, you know, was, uh, you know, subject to the infamous evil empire speech in which uh, he compared the Soviet Union to, to an evil uh, empire. Uh, and everything that was uh, wrong in international relations was caused by this, uh, you know, evil communist bully, uh, which, you know, th this is how Reagan viewed uh, the Soviets. Um, we have a massive military uh, buildup um, uh, in uh, the greatest U.S. military buildup in peacetime history, over three, two uh, trillion dollars. Many of uh, Reagan's um, supporters claim that he outspent the Soviets into economic uh, collapse, but he really was this nuclear abolitionist. That you know, his faith was that uh, to use technology made it invincible. So we had this uh, mentioned that previously uh, in the uh, nuclear deterrence uh, uh, module uh, that uh, you know the Star Wars initiative, uh, this ballistic missile uh, defense would make the United States invincible. Uh, um, so he, a lot of money was poured uh, into uh, into that research and development, but a lot of money was also built up, uh, poured into the actual military uh, buildup. It was the end of the self-imposed Vietnam syndrome, you know, encouraged public for more militarized, more interventionist uh, foreign policy. And he really, if you look at Latin America, if you look at Middle East, he made overt what used to be a covert. So again, commitment to low intensity warfare, military action through allies and proxies and also U.S. forces uh, itself. Uh, again, we talked about the distinction between capitalist authoritarian and communist totalitarian regimes uh, where the U.S. under Reagan uh, favored working with capitalist authoritarian uh, regimes. Uh, as I said, uh, Iran also became the defining uh, factor um, for Reagan's foreign policy. It uncovered executive crimes uh, done by the Reagan administration. Uh, and it was um, the Iran-Contra scandal, uh, as it became known, uh, was really um, uh, the uh, the biggest scandal of the Reagan administration. Uh, as you see in the photo, Oliver North, he was a colonel uh, uh, working in the National Security Council. He was the person in charge uh, of uh, the Iran-Contra scandal of that operation. 
uh, and he became kind of the poster child for you know um, conservatives at the time. Uh, so when uh, all of that became public, uh, and when he testified uh, before a Congress, uh, he was very um, uh, hawkish uh, in his answers, and he was um, you know convinced that everything he did he was authorized uh, to do. Everything he did was uh, you know reflecting U.S. interests. Uh, in uh, the uh, both the Middle East uh, and uh, in um, the uh, in, in Latin America. Now the Iran Contra scandal was basically uh, uh, it started uh, with U.S. hostages uh, in uh, Lebanon. Everybody had hostages uh, uh, in Lebanon. You had the Germans, the French, the British, uh, different Europeans. Uh, Lebanon itself uh, was you know going uh, subject to a civil war. Uh, now, who had, uh, as much as the U.S. government, or uh, rather Hollywood likes us to believe, is that the U.S. does not negotiate with terrorists. Everybody negotiates uh, with terrorists and hostage takers. Um, now, Iran had um, rather uh, good contacts, two different uh, Shia militias at the time. Uh, so the idea was that Iran would help the U.S. Uh, to release those hostages. Now, Iran at the time... Um, needed uh, weapons, uh, it uh, needed um, uh, support, uh, it was a fighting a war against Saddam Hussein uh, uh, at the time, which ironically the US uh, supported too, uh, as well as the Europeans, the Germans, the French uh, and, and the British uh, in, uh, in particular. Now the Iran Contra really was a, a rather uh, complex uh, operation in which the United States, uh, through different proxies, particular uh, Israeli weapons dealers, were uh, supplying Iran with weapons. Those proceeds, then uh, that you know illicit illicit money, uh, was uh, then used to support a right wing terrorist group called the Contras in Nicaragua, uh, which uh, uh, the Contras are fighting uh, a um, socialist democratic elected government. Uh, um, and it was decided in the National Security Council that you know those illicit funds which uh, were given to the Iranians, with the intent that the Iranians would help the U.S. to re uh, to get those hostages back in Lebanon, those profits proceeds from the illicit uh, uh, money uh, from those sales were then given to the Contras uh, to help them fight the uh, uh, socialist uh, government in uh, Nicaragua. Now publicly. Uh, Reagan defended that they weren't doing anything uh, to overthrow any governments, in particular the Nicaraguan government. By '83, the CIA had the so-called murder manual, which taught selective violence against civilian targets, judges, village magistrates, any sort of officials associated with uh, the Nicaraguan government. Uh, Reagan tried to reclassify the uh, Contras as freedom fighters, but that did not uh, convince anyone in uh, Congress. Uh, so these are, you know. Do whatever it takes uh, was uh, the the motto or the mantra at the time. CIA, DOD, and National Security Council officials rerouted that money from defense appropriations. That is, that money uh, which uh, was made by selling illicitly to the Iranians, uh, as well as we had some other private donors. Uh, that money then was used uh, to supply the contract. So you can see here one of uh, those uh, in the actual Oval Office. In the back, you see Oliver North. Uh, who, who himself was in charge of shifting those uh, profits. A federal prosecutor said Reagan created these conditions which made possible the crimes committed by others and knowingly participated uh, in uh, those uh, covert actions. The International Court of Justice ruled in 86 that the US violated international law and ought to pay indemnity uh, to Nicaragua. Now Reagan never uh, accepted that the International Court of Justice had jurisdiction over the US, which of course it has. Uh, Again, uh, at the Tower Commission, uh, Reagan said, um, so when all of this became public, all of this became public when a CA plane uh, crash landed in the Nicaraguan jungle. And it was after that, there has already been a suspicion that something illicit was happening or was being done by the US government. Uh, and it then snowballed and became public. Uh, and, you know, Congress then uh, uncovered uh, the entire extent of the scandal. Uh, Reagan said at uh, the Tau Commission when he himself testified that uh, his uh, you know, concern of the plight of the hostages really was the dominating factor as coupled uh, with the overriding goal of defeating uh, communism.
which was seen uh, as what was happening uh, in Nicaragua. After all, it was a socialist government which ought to be um, defeated uh, with the help of, of those Contras. Now, moving on to the Middle East, uh, I mentioned the Lebanese civil war was going on. These were the hostages. Uh, the U.S. Uh, was actively uh, involved uh, in uh, that uh, civil war by actually sending uh, UN peacekeepers uh, in um, largely U.S. forces uh, in uh, into Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon had different um, different factions, different militias: Shia, Sunni, uh, Christian, uh, and uh, Druze uh, militias. So every every religion really had their own militias attached to it, and it was a sectarian conflict. And we had the Israelis also involved. Uh, we, after all, we had the PLO leadership was based uh, in Lebanon. Uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Begin uh, really kept saying that they don't have a, the Americans don't have a moral right uh, to preach us. Uh, so relations between uh, the U.S. Uh, and Israel were quite poor at the time, and uh, Begin was no friend uh, of uh, Reagan. Um, so the U.S. peacekeeping focus was one was to expel the PLO as well as uh, Israeli uh, forces. Now what happened was uh, we had two uh, big terrorist attacks against U.S. forces. Uh, one was the U.S. Marines were um, attacked, 241 uh, Marines were killed. And then the see in the photo that there's the U.S. Embassy which killed 63 people. The U.S. Embassy in Beirut <coughs> excuse me, really was the... Um, the main uh, uh, station for the CA for the entire Middle East. Uh, so when 63 people killed, that killed a lot of CIA agents as well as uh, U.S. diplomats working for the State Department. Uh, it was the greatest loss of life for uh, the CA uh, in CA history. Now what Reagan did after that, uh, he ordered U.S. forces to withdraw from Lebanon, which a lot of conservatives uh, at the time uh, criticized him for because uh, if you withdraw forces after you're being attacked, that shows a great sign of a weakness. Now, uh, to the credit of Reagan, his Secretary of State Schultz, uh, he came up with the land for peace formula, which to this day is the formula uh, which uh, dictates uh, negotiations between the Palestinians and the Israelis. So land for peace formula means uh, uh, the Palestinians would have the land in exchange that would uh, grant peace and grant recognition of Israeli sovereignty too. So we would have a two-state solution. So this is to this day uh, the formula. Uh, U.S. Uh, Libyan relations were rather poor. Operation Al Dorado was uh, uh, U.S. Uh, coercive measures against uh, the uh, Libyans. Uh, it was in retaliation for US Libyan intelligence uh, killing U.S. servicemen in a Berlin uh, nightclub. Uh, if El Dorado was uh, meant to kill uh, Gaddafi himself uh, in one of his palaces, uh, it, it ended up uh, killing one uh, his uh, uh, step a stepdaughter, not Gaddafi himself, and that again led to Libyan retaliation against the United States uh, when uh, the um, Pan Am flight was bombed uh, by again Libyan intelligence over Lockerbie uh, in. Um, uh, over Scotland, you might have heard of the Lockerbie bombing. So that was in retaliation for opera Operation El Dorado. Now again, uh, I mentioned earlier uh, the in the Iran Contra scandal that you know Iran needed weapons to fight the Iraqis, and again, ironically, the Iraqis were supported by uh, the U.S. You see here Donald Rumsfeld, who was the special representative for the Middle East. He would later become. Uh, Secretary uh, of Defense under uh, George W. Bush, uh, shaking hands with Saddam Hussein. Uh, it was under the Reagan administration uh, that realists would call it, you know, offshore balancing that we don't really get involved ourselves. We don't have forces, uh, but we like to watch at the sidelines how two countries actually are involved in violent conflict. Uh, so uh, provision of intelligence, so the Iraqis knew where the uh, Iranians, uh, you know, were moving their troops, um, supported the UN, supported, you know, different international economic organizations, the World Bank and IMF. After all, this was an 80 year long war between Iran and Iraq. So again, financial uh, support. Uh, in 87, a U.S. frigate, the Stark, was hit by Iraqi missiles, which the Iraqis were forgiven. Uh, we had more of a U.S. naval presence, uh, and then uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, de facto entered the war on the side of Saddam Hussein by reflagging Kuwaiti tankers uh, 
as U.S. vessels. So again, there was the so-called tanker war where the Iranians and the Iraqis were hitting each other's tankers. It uh, really was economic, mutual economic uh, and environmental strangulation. You had the main lifeline for any of those countries in the Middle East uh, is oil. Uh, and both, uh, you know, were set on uh, in destroying uh, the other's oil lifelines. That was, of course, huge environmental and, of course, mutual economic uh, disaster. The way the way the war ended, it, the USS Vincent, a U.S. vessel, uh, shot down an Iranian airliner, which it mista uh, mistakenly uh, took for a hostile aircraft. This was an Iran Airlines flight. Uh, which 280 uh, tourists uh, on board, all of which uh, were killed. It was after that that Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of the uh, of Iran, took what he said. He drank the chalice of poison and accepted uh, uh, accepted uh, a ceasefire uh, between uh, Iran uh, and uh, Iraq. Uh, so you can see that the story of Reagan in the Middle East uh, was one of you know coercive diplomacy. Um, covert as well as overt military support uh, and the use of force looking at Lebanon, looking at uh, Iraq, uh, looking at uh, Libya was used uh, as uh, an important uh, foreign policy uh, tool. So the assignment uh, for this module was to write a one-page brief defending your covert arm sales and covert support for the Congre Contras uh, to Congress. So again, uh, Imagine you were in the National Security Council and you have to provide a one-page brief uh, on that. So a very, very, really very uh, uh, small assignment, literally brief assignment. Uh, you know, do some research, uh, textbook, as well as other uh, documents you find uh, on the Iran-Contra scandal. Again, the National uh, George Washington National Security Archive has a lot of information uh, on that. Have fun with that. Good luck.